Back in 2013, we went to Iceland to a company called Deco Genetics, who were doing genetic research on what is a pretty unusual country. See, Iceland has a record of its people's ancestry going back a thousand years, and therefore it has some idea of who shares genes with who. Icelanders have also been donating blood to the company for years, which is then deep frozen in this blood bank so it can be used for future research into what genes may make people resistant or susceptible to certain diseases. And now that is paying off in spades. I spoke to the director of Decode earlier and he told me that having sequenced the genes of half of the population, he's had a massive head start in trying to work out why the coronavirus affects some people worse than others. This team has been working together for almost a quarter of a century and it is almost like everything else we have done, it feels like that, that it was merely a preparation for this. We have enormous amount of data on the people who got infected. We are in a privileged position to look at the genetics of the patients and see how the genetics influences the probability of getting infected and the probability of getting seriously ill when you become infected. Decode has now tested nearly 14% of the population for the coronavirus, the highest in any country, and that's really informed our understanding of COVID-19. For example, he says that contrary to some reports, it seems that nearly everyone who has the disease does eventually display symptoms. And the race is now on to understand why those symptoms range so wildly from the very mild to the very severe. Is it because they previously caught a different coronavirus and developed some immunity? Or is it to do with different strains of the virus itself? Viruses naturally mutate as they travel from one person to another, and as this one has spread, it's morphed into many different strains that can be identified from its genetic data and which are being shared by scientists across the world. What's not known at the moment is whether some strains are more harmful than others. When viruses mutate, they usually mutate to become more infectious and less harmful because the evolutionary goal of the virus is to go as widely as possible, to become as many as possible. And if the virus causes a serious disease, then it limits the transmission because the person who becomes seriously ill is not going to move around to spread the virus. But this virus has found a way around this because most people are mildly infected and they can roam around and spread the virus all over the place. But then there are the few unfortunate so this virus has the best of both worlds. It can spread widely and it can kill. What's also fascinating is that because the virus has mutated as it's travelled across the world, it's possible for geneticists to examine a patient and tell them the route that their infection took as it travelled from China. In the US, for example, the virus first arrived on the west coast directly from China. But meanwhile, another strain was making its way across Europe and it arrived in New York in the middle of March. And that was the strain that eventually came to dominate the country, probably because New York is the gateway most Americans use to come back home. And while Italy seemed to be the epicentre of the European outbreak, something else was going unnoticed when the authorities were focusing on, on people coming from ski vacations in the Alps, the virus was clearly sneaking into the country from other countries, such as Great Britain. And it's absolutely clear that very early in the epidemic, the virus was widely spread in British society, because a very significant proportion of the cases in Iceland came to Iceland through those who were travelling from Great Britain. Despite everything, Iceland is now starting to recover from the epidemic. It's come through with very few deaths and without the complete lockdown that many countries have enforced. This, says Dr. Stephenson, is because with widespread testing, the country could quickly find those who were infected, trace who they'd been in contact with, and then just isolate those people 
stopping the epidemic before it got out of control. Some, of course, would say that Iceland has had it relatively easy with its small population and remote location. With these kind of measures, including this massively manually intensive contact tracing, work in bigger countries like the UK? Listen to me. There is no alibi in your size, all right? You could be, use exactly the same methods that we have used. And I think that you could be as effective as we, just as long as there is a will and there are resources to do it. Yes, in, in, uh, in Great Britain, you have a lot more people who are infected because your population size is, is incredibly much larger than ours, but you have also more people to do the work. I think that what is amazing when you look at the uh, Look at this epidemic, at the, that the two most resourceful countries in the world, really, the United Kingdom and the United States, that they were so completely unprepared for this. This has been a demonstration of how preparation and early action has saved lives. But it's also a demonstration of how far technology has come to be able to crunch the enormous amount of data that is now spotting needles in genetic haystacks. I think that what this epidemic is showing is how incredibly powerful it is to be able to bring together a large amount of information, to bring it together and mine it effectively. We would not have been able to do this uh, 20 years ago.